blessed. Blessings to all who view this video. I am Brother Joseph Herbert. May the grace and the glory of God be on the faithful and the righteous. May the Holy One of Israel, Jesus Christ, the one who was prophesied in the beginning, the one that was with the Father from the beginning, give you ears to hear the voice and truth of his word. May he give you eyes to see so that discernment by his spirit can affect and stir you up to everlasting life because this is a journey. I'm Brother Joseph Herbert, so yes, I want to talk about your sight, whom do you seek, whom do you see, what, what is the purpose for vision, what is the purpose for sight, God gave you eyes to see. Um, when I was in high school, matter of fact, all the way from elementary, I was a big science, I love science, I used to love science, because it was more realistic to me. My opinion, it was more realistic than history. It was more real. I never, I didn't like math. I didn't like, I did like English, but scientists, science was my subject that I liked. And I used to like watching Discovery Channel and tornadoes and studying the weather and the, and, uh, the galaxies and the planets and stuff like that. So God gives you eyes to see. What I have been studying before that I have known that your eye, every each eye has 137 light sensitive cell, cells called cones that's in the retina. God made your human eye to see. This is a gate to your soul. Your ears are gates to your soul. So you have to focus Jesus says the light of the body is the eye. So <laughs> if your eye be single, you got two eyes. So that means you see one. That means you focus on the purpose for your life. The purpose for your life is Jesus Christ. And if your eye be single, your whole body will be full of light, full of his glory, full of his wisdom. God, by wisdom, by his wisdom, found the earth, the word of God says his understanding established the heavens and his knowledge broke, broken up the depths and the clouds dropped down to do many. He made everything according to his discretion, his detail, his judgment. He is Lord God of all creation. So, yes, I've been meditating on the word of God as the Christian, the ones who who are truly born again are supposed to do every day because this is your life. The instructions by God to order your steps. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so what do you see? You are born for a purpose. You are born for a purpose. You are created for God to serve him, to worship him, to focus on his will and whatever his will for your life, you are to follow the, the one whom, whom he sent, Jesus Christ. Again, so seeing, I had took some notes from my pastor at church, not this past service, but this Friday night service. So he said some interesting things dealing with the sight. He said, seeing isn't just imagery. Seeing is experiencing the effects that it has, which is a profound truth because what you see is going to affect who you are. The word of God says, um, as face answers to face or reflects face, so it, as in water, that's right. As in water, face answers to face, so a man's heart reveals the man. So what is in man's heart is who he is. So what you focus on is what you desire. What you see is what you desire. What do you desire in this life? Man, apart from salvation in Christ, they don't seek after God. That's what 
Paul in Romans chapter 3 said. And he was quoting from Psalms. The, the, the fear of God is not before their eyes. They don't fear God. Man that is not born again, man who is not saved, they do not reverence the Holy One of Israel, the, 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 the Lord God Almighty. They may have a Bible on their dashboard and say, oh yeah, I'm saved. Or, oh yeah, I go to church. I was baptized since I was nine years old. My pastor or my uncle did it. But they live a lifestyle that is ungodly. They live a lifestyle that rejects the holy child, Jesus Christ. So, I got to quote it again because it was powerful. Seeing, it had me thinking of some other things too. Dealing with sight and also in the word of God. So he says, seeing isn't just imagery. Seeing is experiencing the effects that it has. And to add on, your eyes, again, your eyes, there are 130. There are 137 light sensitive cells in each human eye. You, your eye is supposed to see for the purpose of God. You have Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm going to go there real fast. Jeremiah chapter 1 says this. And the Lord spoke to Jeremiah and he asked Jeremiah a question. He asked it twice in this one chapter. As I go to it, give me one second. I like to turn the pages. I like to hear the turning of the pages. This is how you know that God's word is true. You, you love the, the word of God is the bread of life. You feed on the word. So, yes, verse 9 of chapter 1, it says this. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Now, the Lord asked Jeremiah a question. He says this. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Moreover, now verse 11, here it is. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? What seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Now he's going to, dis he's going to discern when the Lord ask you though it says the word of the lord so this is before christ jesus is the known is known as the word of god so you have father son and holy ghost before the son was revealed the word of the lord came up on this prophet and asked him because when god speaks there's power being transmitted so a question of power is being transmitted to Jeremiah the prophet to prompt him to answer. He says this, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Now, what did he saw? Verse 12, it says, Then the Lord said to me, You have well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Meaning he will quicken, he will, since he saw well, since he saw this, this uh, rod of an almond tree, he saw well, he saw what the Lord wanted him to see and answered rightly. He judged rightly, he discretion, his discretion was well, and he answers and says, so since you've seen well, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And this is what he saw, verse 13, and the word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, Again, he asked him a question. Again, the Lord asked him a question. The word of the Lord. And I said, I see a seething pot, meaning I see a boiling pot. And the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said to me, now he's about to explain what he saw, that he saw well. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. Uh, Jeremiah was in Jerusalem and Judah. This is before the captivity. This is before the captivity of when King Nebuchadnezzar was about to hold him captive. King Zedekiah wasn't reigning just yet. But this is what Jeremiah the prophet sees when the Lord asks, asks him a question. It says, Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord, and they shall come and they shall set over, uh, set every one of his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem and against all the walls thereof round about and against all the cities of Judah. So he's describing 
the besieging of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar about to hold them captive because of their sin, because of their idolatry. This is what the Lord wanted the prophet Jeremiah to see in order for him to prophesy. And even though they was not going to listen or take heed, the, the, when God asks you a question, when God commands you to do something, obedience is better than sacrifice. So what am I saying? Seeing what what are you seeing as a believer in Christ Jesus? I've been asking the Lord to enhance um, my discernment. So this is what happened to me in prayer yesterday. I have a one year old son. Um, my one year old son was in the room while I was in while I was prayer time. So I was I pray I'm praying in the most my most holy faith, and I'm like in my mind as my Mouth is moving, praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues. And I'm asking the Lord, Lord, enhance my sight to uh, see what you want me to see, to enhance my discernment on spiritual matters, on things that you want me to see. Enhance my focus. That's my main, my primary asking of the question. Enhance my focus on your will for my life. And what he did was, while my son was active in the room with me, he, you know, my son is active. He's a, he's one years old. So he comes to me while I'm praying in the spirit and has a, he has a little uh, beanie cap. He hands me a beanie cap. So while he hands me this, I'm trying to like avoid distraction, but he hands me this as the Lord answers my question. So I take the beanie cap and like, okay, Lord, what are you saying right here? The helmet of salvation. Okay, this goes on your head. That Okay, yes, Lord God, enhance my capability to focus with the helmet of salvation, the helmet of deliverance. And then my son grabs a toy. It was a, a monkey, a, a monkey with holding symbol, clashing symbols. And I said, yeah, okay, Lord, yes, we have dominion over the animals. You said in Genesis chapter 1, man has dominion in all the earth, dominion. Over the fowls of the air, over the fish in the sea, we have dominion because you made man the last creature that you created. And he was doing something else. What else? Was oh, yes. He went to the closet door. I said, yes, Lord God. It's like he was asking me. The Lord was asking me, what do you see? I see doors closed. He's about to open it. And I, when I did like this to my son, don't open the door. Don't, open, don't do that. I, I didn't use my mouth, but I did like this. I did like this. I was like, Lord, keep, keep my family, keep those who I love, those who are in my church from opening doors that you don't want us to open in Jesus' name. And let our obedience be as the wind and the sea when you commanded it to be still. And when your disciples all marvel, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And that was prophesied. That was prophesied. And I want to point that out, too, as well. Before I, I'm going to come back to Jeremiah, because there's another verse in Jeremiah chapter 24. But that was prophesied when Jesus rebuked the wind and the sea and his disciples all marveled. They marveled. What manner of man is, is this? This was prophesied in Psalms 65. As I turn there. So it says this. Is it Psalm Yep, Psalm 65. Listen closely to this. this. This again was prophesied. Jesus rebuked the wind and the sea to know that this, this holy child Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. God in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ concealed. The New Testament, the New Covenant is Jesus Christ revealed. Now it says this in Psalm 65. I'm going to start in verse 6. It says, which by his strength, it's talking about the Lord, which by his strength sets fast the mountains being girded with power. Now listen to this. He says, which steals the noise of the seas. The noise of their waves and the tumult of the people, meaning the 
chaotic noise of the people. That Jesus did that. He reproved the Pharisees by the doctrine of his father. He he shut up the, the Sadducees because they didn't believe in the resurrection. The Lord reproved men and he rebukes the wind and the sea. He, it says right here, Psalm 65 verse 7, which steals the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves and the tumult of the people. So that prophesied about Christ being who he is in the New Testament, being and making it evident proof that he exists and he is true. The Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. So I want to turn to Jeremiah 24. Back to whom do you see? What do you see in this life? What are your what is your focus set on? Is your eyes Watching that you should not watch, that God despises. And I'm talking to the ones who don't have any clue where they're going after they die. If you view this message and you hear truth of the gospel, you are without excuse. You have choices to make. And as what Moses said in Deuteronomy 30, he says, Today I call heaven and earth. To record this day against you and have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live and that you may, Lord, that you may love the Lord your God and that you may cleave to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. I love the way he put that. That he is your life and the length of your days. Meaning he grants you everlasting life. That was prophetic about everlasting life because God is light in him. There is no darkness. So Jeremiah 24, I'm so, I feel so stirred up with this topic. So Jeremiah 24 is right here. Let me go back. Give me one second. All right. Jeremiah 24. I know which verse that is. The Lord said in verse three, listen to closely to this. Matter of fact, to get the context, let me start in verse 1. So the Lord showed me, he's speaking to Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah is speaking and saying, The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord after that Nebuchadnezzar, who is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive. Jochaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from... Jerusalem and have brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe, and the other baskets had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then, here it is, the Lord asked again the prophet Jeremiah a question from the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the word of the Lord, the Father, and his spirit. That, that are one, ask him a question. Then the Lord said to me, what do you see as thou, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil figs, very evil. They That cannot be eaten. They are so evil, meaning they are corrupt. Jesus says, make the, tr make the tree and its fruit good. Make the fruit and its, I, of oh God, he put it. Make the tree and its fruit good, or make the tree and its fruit corrupt. He who bears uh, good fruit, he who does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's what Jesus says. So this is like good figs So and evil figs. Then, I'm going to read verse 3 again. Then said the Lord unto me, what do you see as thou, Je uh, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, uh, very evil that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good feet. So he's explaining, he's opening up his understanding and discernment of what Jeremiah saw. These good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah. He's talking about the captivity of Judah. The, those who will be under captivity, but they still serve the Lord at a certain degree. He says, so will I acknowledge them, the Lord, them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out 
of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Jesus says, whatever my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up, will be uprooted. That's what Jesus says. But the Lord is speaking on the righteous ones who was in held of captivity to Judah and Jerusalem. And so in verse seven, it says, and I will give them a heart to know me. You want the Lord to give you a heart to know him because the unrighteous, those who die in sin, die in iniquity, allowing that to be their, the ruin of their life, they will stand before God. You will stand before God one day. If you're not born again, you will hear, depart from me. I never knew you. I'm not trying to scare you, just giving you truth of what it is when you stand before God. So if, you're, if your relationship is solidified in Christ Jesus, that he is your rock and that the <laughs> tri uh, tribulations will, we're going to have tribulations. We're going to have adversity. We're going to have the desires of the flesh that we have to fight off. We're going to have conditions of our heart that we have to maintain and keep pure before God because God says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. We have to maintain the balance. The word of God says a just weight and balance are his delight. A false balance are an abomination to the Lord. So in verse 8 it says, And the, and as the evil figs which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely this says the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land and them that dwell in the land of Egypt and I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt or be to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places where there I shall drive them and I will send the sword the famine and the pestilence. What's the pestilence? That's like an epidemic. That's like a plague as an epidemic as the today's worldly terminology, they will use that. They will, a plague or epidemic, that's pestilence. The word of God calls it pestilence. Among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave give unto them and to their fathers. So the Lord promised uh, Zedekiah you know, if he doesn't commit, if he doesn't humble himself under the hand of the king of Babylon to be to go in, Zedekiah will not die. But yet, if he does not, he will die. Him and the residue uh, or the remainders of Jerusalem and Judah that will be under captivity. Those are the bad fig trees that the prophet Jeremiah saw and that the Lord asked him. So you have Jesus Christ in, I believe it's Mark chapter 8, where Jesus healed the blind man and he asked the individual, the blind man that was healed, he asked him, here it is right here, praise the Lord. It says in verse 22 of chapter 8 of Mark, it says, and he, Jesus Christ, comes to Bethsaida and they bring a blind man to him. And besought him to touch him. <coughs> Excuse me. And he looked, he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spat on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught, meaning, do, do you see anything? Here's what the blind man said he saw. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Now, a person who's born blind. How do they, how can they identify men or and how can they identify trees? He says, I see men as trees walking. He saw a dimension. He saw something in the spirit for that that interval, for that space, for that moment. And I'm going to read it again. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. 
After that, he put Jesus Christ put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw everything, every man clearly. He gave that. Can you imagine a man that was born blind, seeing for the first time, seeing colors that he may not have ever saw before, seeing detailed visual trees, trees that you never saw. This that's a tree. That's a man walking. That's this is this is sand. This is water. This is what what is man? This is beautiful. Imagine what your your sight will be in heaven for those who are going to spend forever with God. For those who are truly born again. I love the way it says in First John. I believe it's chapter three. It is chapter three. Now that we are sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we will be, but we know that when He appears. We will see him as he is. And guess what? It says, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Who are the pure in heart? Those that see God. So every person, every man of God, every woman of God that has their, their hope in Jesus Christ, they purify themselves. And what is the action of that? Spending time in the presence of the Lord. You need the presence of God. There's healing in the presence of God. There's power in the presence of God. There is peace in the presence of God. There is, oh my goodness, the Lord is so holy. Jesus Christ reveals himself to those who seek him. Zephaniah puts it like this. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth. Seek righteousness that the Lord's anger will be hid from you. He wants you to humble yourself. He wants you to be meek. Jesus says, bless are the meek for they will inherit the earth. The meek are described as the, those who are slow to anger, modest in their behavior, and prompt to obey. The Apostle Paul, when he encountered Jesus Christ for the very first time because he thought he was right, the second thing he asked, well, he, first he said, who are you, Lord? And the second thing he asked, what must I do? He was ready to obey the Lord, but he and he was blinded. He was engulfed by the light. He was blinded for three days, and, and he sends Ananias. The Lord sends Ananias to lay his hands on him and to baptize him in the Holy Ghost. Now you have one of the greatest apostles that wrote most a majority of the New Testament. You have a you have apostles that the Lord has written the word. Use them as instruments to write his word. And people don't believe all that. They will say, oh, the Bible is written by man. You most certainly are correct, my friend. You are most certainly correct. He, the Bible is written by men. But listen closely. The Bible is written by men full of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God on them. How do you think God can write, the, is able to get the word out? He used them as instruments. If I decide to write you a letter... Who writes the letter, myself or the pen? What well, is myself, right? Because I'm controlling the pen as an instrument to write you a letter. Likewise for the Lord to use his prophets, his apostles to write the word of God. The word of God, all scripture, I love quoting this verse. All scripture is given by inspiration by God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof and correction and instructions in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished to every good work. So you have work to do as a man of God, as a son of God. You have work to do to minister the word of God, the word of truth, the gospel, the glad tidings, the, the spirit of prophecy of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ, that is the spirit of prophecy, is also the power of God unto salvation to those that, to all those that believe from the Jew first and also to the Greek. You have work to do. You're supposed to be of your father's business if you are professing to be Christian. So, the blind, Jesus heals the blind man and puts his hands on him and he says, I see men as trees. He saw every man clearly and he sent them away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. 
And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples among them, whom do you say that I am? So, yes, yeah, so that's, that's it, it shifts right here. But he tells the person who he heals, tell, uh, the, the man is re rejoicing that he can see for the first time. Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. So he didn't want to tell this. He didn't want to make the Lord. Jesus didn't want to make himself known just yet. And so he commanded him not to tell anybody. But the man sees. He has sight now. And so now the, the, the blind man that was healed in John chapter 9 is very different. Now he was opposed. He was questioned by the Pharisees who asked him. What did he do to you? And the man was, you know, they asked for his parents. They didn't believe him that told him it, he, put, he put clay on my eyes and he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he washed. Now I have sight. So he explained this stuff to the Pharisees in John chapter 9. He explained this, the, these, the, this encounter to the Pharisees in John chapter 9. So if you are in darkness... If you are reject, if you think you're right, if pride is governing your decisions, you're not going to be able to see anything. You're going to be in, you're going to be in darkness. You gotta you gotta recognize, you know, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You have to humble yourself. God gives sight to those who he who he loves. He wants. The sons of God to see clearly what he wants them to see. He wants, we want to see God. When I say we, I'm talking about the sons of God, those who are truly born again. I want to see God manifest every day. When I'm in church, when I'm in the presence of God in prayer, I want to see my, my Lord Jesus Christ manifest every day. Because he does, he does so. And so, yes, the Pharisees didn't believe the blind man that was healed. So they call his, the man's parents like he was a child or something. And the, his parents was like, he is of age. Ask him. And, and the word of God says they said that out of fear because they feared the, the ones, who, they feared the Jews. That they was going to get kicked out, whoever confesses that, the, that Jesus is the Christ. So they asked the man again. And the man was like, why, you know, why do you want to... I told you already. Why do you want to hear it again? Let's see. This is verse 24. Matter of fact, I'm going to read verse 24. Then again called they the man that was blind and said to him, Give God the praise. Now they tell him to give God the praise. In their unbelief. In their own perspective. Now give God the praise. What do you know about praising God? Without, without understanding. And Jesus reproved people like them. Pharisees. Then they called the man uh, that was blind and said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And, you know, discernment was in on the man's, the man is, can see now. God opened, God manifested in the flesh, opened the man's eyes. He can see now. He has discernment, spiritual discernment. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that Whereas I was blind, now I see. And he answered them, and that it you, you you can sense the level of truth that can shut these people men these men up that that don't believe. But they continue because they was very prideful. Then said they to him again, "What did he do to you? He how did he open your eyes?" He answered them, "I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, or why would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples?" Then they re then they reviled him and says, "And you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples." They they thought they know the law. They they had the scriptures, but they the scriptures, but they think they have eternal life, and they didn't. The man answered and said to them. Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from where he is or where he's from, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. So professed believers that or those who think they are truly born again, 
Does God hear your prayers? How do you know God hears your prayers? Because he said, the, the, the man that was blind, that was healed by Jesus, says this as a rebuke. <coughs> he says, we, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but those who are a worshiper of him and does his will, he hears them. The word of God says, the prayers of the righteous avails much. What makes man righteous? His commitment to Jesus Christ. His devout life, his devoted mind and heart and strength and lifestyle to Jesus Christ. Him, the prayers, he hears them. When man wants to commit to Jesus Christ, and that's why you know what is called the sinner's prayer. By faith, if you believe, Paul said this in Romans chapter 10. That if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. You will be saved. And so, Jesus Christ, the Lord, God the Father, hear those, hear those people's prayers. The Pharisees, there was not of the will of the Father. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. The scribes. The Jews, most of the Jews, um, and those who were just not, you know, you had the Samaritan women that didn't believe until Jesus Christ ministered to her, to her and, and prophesied pretty much to her. And then she now believes. You have these events, these encounters. You're supposed to believe on the Son of God. And the Pharisees did not believe the man that was once blind. Now it now can see. They are ready to like condemn him by their unbelief. And you can't. Because once you are solidified in Christ Jesus as a son of God, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So in verse 32, let's see where I'm at. Now we know that, yeah. I'm in verse 32. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And then it says in verse 34, they answered and said unto him. See, they're, they're getting angry right here. You was altogether born in sins. How did they know that? You know, how did they know that? You was altogether born in sins. And do you teach us? And they cast him out because that truth pricked them to their heart. They didn't know where he was. Jesus Christ was from. They didn't believe on the miracle that happened to the man that was born blind. They didn't believe that his parents, his parents says he is old enough. Ask him. And they still did not believe him. So what does what happens in the nap in, in today's modern day time when you don't believe in the miracles, when you don't believe in the power of God, when you don't believe in the laying on of hands or the gift of tongues or the casting out of devils, God will classify you as an unbeliever. You reject the will of God. You know not the power of God. You know not the truth of God's word. You may know it to a certain degree, but do you have everlasting life? Do you, are you truly born again? Are you on a plateau? Are you, are you, are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Lord? Are you on a plateau? Are you stagnated? That's the word. Are you stagnated? Meaning, are you just there? Are you, do you profess to be a Christian, but you are doing nothing in your temple, in your body that is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You are doing nothing but just going to, going to church. Are you teaching, preaching, ministering, doing the things that Jesus did and said? Are you obeying? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. What is your life? James puts it like this. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Your life is but a vapor. Ecclesiastes, the preacher in Ecclesiastes puts it like this. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. Meaning, your eyes are precious. These, your eyes are windows to your soul. It's better to have the sight of the eyes for the purpose of God than the wandering of the desires. Because your heart wanders for things. 
that especially if you're not born again, you're gonna wonder for bad. You're gonna have bad desires, bad emotions that you're gonna be committed to. That's why the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. God knows your heart, so when you are in despair of life, me and my wife was talking about. Before conversion, before we was born again, and I, I talked about my, you know, how vanity or worthlessness of the things I was doing, it was just so worthless. Like, how long would I continue to go to this place that everybody else is going? How long would I listen? How, would I be 45 years old still listening to secular music, to the next rapper or the next uh, singer? Making their next album and listening to their lyrics. How long would I enjoy worldly language that has zero effect on my life, that does not edify, it's not going to benefit me anything when I stand before God? How long would I listen? Because I used to be in, into hip hop, I used to try to be a rapper. How long would I continue to do this? And it's not benefiting me nothing. And then, you know, the Lord allowed me to see for a brief second that the, the, the rappers who I used to listen to in the 90s, they're still rapping at age 55. They're still doing tours and concerts. When they die, they're not going to heaven. When they die, they are going to a place of torment because they have not committed to Jesus Christ. They have not eternal life. Life is in Christ. John chapter 1 describes that. But the focus is the will of God and knowing that you are supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. The man that got healed by Jesus was cast out by the Pharisees. In verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe on the Son of God? Now, Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh, asked this question just as well as the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet asking, what do you see? You have God manifested in the flesh. God that created all things, heaven and earth. Ask the man that he healed that was blind. Now he sees. He asked this man a question. Do you believe on the son of God? He didn't say the son of man. He said the son of God. He answered the, the man that was healed. He answered and said, who is he, Lord? The same response that Saul before he was Paul the Apostle, the same response when he encountered the Lord on the road to Damascus when he was ready to kill Christians, the same response he asked the Lord, who, uh, who are you, Lord? What kind of question is that? What kind of, you, who are you? You call it, you asking who he is, but you're saying who he is. He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? He was ready to believe on him. 37, and Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he that talks with you. Jesus Christ letting him know that he is the Son of God. Do you believe on the Son of God? And verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. He worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 39 now, I love the way he says this because the ungodly, the Pharisees, those who did not believe on the Lord, even in the modern day, modern day time, will not understand this. Jesus says, for judgment, I am come into the world that they which see not might see, and they that which see might be made blind. Now, what did he mean by that? Because the Pharisees were wondering the same thing. In verse 40, and some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Now, what did he mean by that? Because 
out of the pride, out of the proudness of his heart, they say we see. So they think they know things. They think they know the law of Moses. They think that and because of their unbelief, they reject the miracle that happened right before their eyes. The man that was once born blind was clearly telling them he he told me to, he told me he put clay on my eyes and told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And now I'm able to see. He clearly told them that what happened. And then they didn't believe him. So then they get the man's parents and the parents you know like the man is a child. You no, know, the man is not 11 years old. The man is not seven years old. The man is a grown. He's a grown man. And they, they ask for his parents. The parents come in. He is of age. Ask him. And they still did not believe. Then they come to him and says, give God the praise. What exactly happened to you? Jesus Christ did this. So he he responds and, you know, I've told you already. Why do you want to hear it again? You no, know, likewise for those I have people I had people in my life when I got converted, they were wondering, did you get in an accident or something? No. I believed on Jesus Christ. I received him as, as my Lord and Savior. I received the Holy Ghost and I was baptized. I believe what his word says and his promises in his word, which testifies, says, Paul, I'm going to quote this again in Romans chapter 10, that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Truth, that's truth. You have to believe that. Saved from what? Saved from God. Saved for God. Saved by God. Why from God? Because the wrath of God abides on the children of disobedience. Saved for God because the mercy of God endures forever and he loves you. He, he demonstrated that on the cross 2,000 years ago. And saved by God because Jesus Christ is in the flesh. He, he was alive. Then he was dead. Behold, he is alive forevermore. And guess what? He's coming back at an hour you do not expect. Behold, he comes in the clouds and every eye, every eye will see him. Even they that pierced him, all kindreds, meaning all nations, all language, will well before him. Even so, amen. King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, he asked his men, when it, the men got tossed into the midst of the burning fiery furnace, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? The one, the one that was with him says, true, O king. Lo, I see four men in the mist walking around in the fire and they have no hurt. And guess what? The form of the fourth is like the son of God. He saw Jesus before Jesus had walked on the planet. He saw them walking in the midst of the fire. The form of the fourth was like the son of God. He saw Jesus. <laughs> it's plain as day. He, he saw Jesus Christ, the Lord. So what do you see when you view a, a when when in this life you are born for the purpose of God, but you're not saved, you're not born again. Every day when you wake up, what do you see? How do you judge life? How do you discern good or evil? Is it at your own discretion or is it at a godly perspective or God's discretion? Where will you go after you die? That's the question. Do you know Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. I am Brother Joseph Herbert, and this is for his glory.